Welcome to the Breakpoint Show, the podcast that breaks down the Netflix docuseries Breakpoint episode by episode. Second batch is out. We did episode six, and now we pick it up with episode seven of the series titled Saints and Sinner. I'm Gil Gross, joined as always for this series by Alex Gruskin. Uh, Grusky, how are you? Let's get into it with uh, the title right away. Are you surprised they burned this very vague title on an episode that doesn't have to do with Yannick Sinner? That's exactly the thought you have coming into the episode is, oh, are we going to see the Italian who, if you recall, at Wimbledon last season was up two sets to love on Novak Djokovic in the quarterfinals. It was really the only guy who put a significant scare into Novak throughout the course of the tournament. Yes, they burned the title. I think that's a very ass- fair assessment by you to start the show. It It's indicative of the fact Sinner's not a main character yet. Maybe they know he's not going to be in season two either. But, yeah, why burn it so soon? It, what's what's the play on words for Yannick? I don't see it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, again, it's not as if that needed to be the episode for this, the title for this episode. I mean, it's completely vague. Uh, this was a continuation of Wimbledon. So this is kind of new because the next episode, let's let's go 1,000 foot view right off the bat. The next episode is going to go to the US Open. So in the first five, we saw the Australian Open got two, but then there was a Madrid thing. There was an Indian Wells thing. It seems like with this second half of the season, they were just like, nope, Two for Wimbledon, two for the U.S. Open. Then I think they'll go to the year-end championship, and that'll be it. So let's get into the majors in more depth. Uh, Cincinnati, never heard of her. Canada, never heard of her. What do you make of that approach? I enjoy it. It allows the plot lines to, A, be further developed than they may otherwise be in a one-episode sequence, and B provides greater detail into what the journey is like. You think about a Grand Slam in the hierarchy of where things stand in the tennis calendar. It is a two-week event. It is a slog through the event, and I don't mind the idea of bequeathing two episodes to each of those slogs to indicate all of the nuances, have time to let all of the storylines breathe. I also can't help myself, so I'll say this quickly— 1,000 foot view would be less than a mile away. That's like a fifth of a mile away. So that view's not that high. But the 10,000 foot view, (laughs) I agree with you. I think it's actually a good idea for this show to explore things like this. Yeah. uh, Ignoring your 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 wise (laughs) comment. Go orange. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, I I just think there's more opportunity to cover more at the majors. I mean. We know as people, I mean, what, you do an hour every day over the course of a major. It's not like it's difficult to do two episodes per major and you're still going to miss a million things. You're still not going to be able to cover a million things. So I like it. Just wanted to start there uh, because we're we're trying to kind of feel out, okay, how is this show evolving and adjusting? Now, we've talked a lot about the tennis matches themselves and how they haven't always been compelling. But the centerpiece of the start of episode both uh, six and now seven is this Titi Curios third round match at Wimbledon. I happen to think that while this did deliver as a match that everybody was watching at home and buzzing about and talking about, I also thought it was a perfect match for this docuseries. And it was probably the most compelling tennis match portrayal that we've seen because the approach that the doc has had to take with these matches is all like mental 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 we're not talking about big break points we're not talking about technique or tactics and strengths and weaknesses like all that stuff is really out the window but for this match well it was actually an example of when we were watching we were like okay like nick is totally in steph's head isn't he and Tsitsipas has no control over his emotions. All of the gamesmanship stuff is totally getting to him. And he can't focus and he can't play well because he's too angry at his opponent to possibly play well. That's what we thought it was when we were watching the match. 
And here, Titi Pass basically is able to kind of reaffirm that, yes, indeed, that is what happened in that match. And I thought it, it made for uh, a really compelling uh, moment in the docuseries. It's a perfect synopsis. It's a perfect summation of what we saw. And this, again, is the benefit of allowing a storyline to play out over two episodes. Part one, not only do you get legitimate conflict, legitimate inciting incidents for, you know, to grasp the viewer's attention, but you also have the scene being set. People like Andy Roddick talking about the volatility of a Nick Kyrgios and, you know, perhaps the exceeded expectations he has for himself. You have someone like Patrick Mortaglu, who, of course, coaches Stefano Tsitsipas, not only offering intimate insight into Tsitsipas, but also his perspective on the challenge that is facing Nick Kyrgios. And you're absolutely right, because for two people who cover tennis, as you and I do, I've said this in prior episodes, our friends, whenever there's a moment in tennis that breaks into the mainstream, I know they all text me. I'm sure all of your friends text you to get our two cents. In real life, this was a match that broke into the mainstream conscience. And you're absolutely right. We all have those memories of watching Tsitsipas fire a ball into the stands and watching Kyrgios continue to plead with the umpire and you know, play the victim card, dare I say, for an on-court scenario like that. And it was fascinating. It was captivating. You had to tune in, regardless of if you were a tennis fan or not. And as you summarized so beautifully, Tsitsipas said, look, you all see it. That's exactly what happened. And I like the cl closure is the wrong word, but it just provides the full scope, which is what a docuseries like this should do. Yeah, if every match was that, then the way yeah. that this series does matches would work. Well, so can I ask you, because I still think the continued prob problems, the wrong word, but a continued question, critique? not even a critique. It's just what do they want to do with the actual points themselves, with the actual tennis that was played? And I still think if you're going to have a critique of their coverage of this match— did we see enough tennis is my question to you. Uh, well, it was the same. No, it was the same thing that we always get when it comes to the tennis, which is not a lot. It, it doesn't refresh me when it comes to like, yes, exactly. oh yeah, like that was that big point. Yes. That was that great shot or yes, or that was the the game at five all like, let's just make a hypothetical here. And this didn't happen in the match, I don't think, but. Let's say at five all in the fifth set, somebody hit two double faults, was broken, and lost the fifth set seven five. I don't think that would get in there. Like I, I'm pretty sure they'd skip to the match point, and it you would have no recollection. Where in the F one doc, when when Verstappen is leading, and then Christian Horner makes a tactical error by making him pit too soon, like that gets in the show. And I understand, you know, sometimes it it's a different sport. So I'm not saying both of them are the same or it's just as easy to portray tennis matches as it is an F1 race. But is that kind of an accurate like analogy and comparison in your opinion? I think you're exactly right. And I don't know if this is a positive or a negative. So this is my last question to you. And then please take us in whatever direction you want to go. I felt compelled after watching this episode, after watching these sequence of episodes in this match unfold, to go back and rewatch the highlights. <laughs> and yeah. I'm curious if, and I ask this to people viewing this episode on the Gil Gross YouTube channel, listening to our Crack Rackets podcast feed, let us know in the comments, did you feel the need to go rewatch it? And if you're a tennis fan, did you think that was a good or a bad thing? If you're just a fan of the show, I, I guess I ask you, is it a good or a bad thing? Is that's the feeling the show evokes? It's bad. It's mostly bad. It's what? not catastrophic. It's not catastrophic. Or but, is it I, good? Because you're like, let me go watch. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the doc, <laughs> it shouldn't leave you with these unanswered questions. Like, yes, I don't really I remember what my, and, and I remember on my post-match analysis, I did about 20, and I think I said this on the last one, I did like 20 minutes on the match, and then I'm like, okay, let's talk about the nonsense and the <laughs> clown show that this match was. So look, uh, you also have to give it this. We talk about viral moments. We talk about moments that go into the mainstream 
and kind of pierce the small bubble that is the Breakpoint documentary. This match had another news cycle because of what Tsitsipas said. Now, we talked about it on the last podcast. We said our piece. I said my piece on Twitter again. I respect everyone who disagrees with that piece. I won't repeat it now. Uh, but Stefanos uh, took to Facebook. Like so many people were talking about what he said, that he wrote this like massive essay long clarification apology, not the most remorseful of apologies, but apology, uh, and tried to just say, get on the record and be like, here's what I meant. And you know, in a very Stefano Tsitsipas way, he had a lot to say. So any thoughts on how this kind of played out in the real world? Well, I just like the idea of you telling that sentence to Dick Edberg being like, yeah, Tsitsipas explained himself on Facebook and Edberg being like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> like, is that a thing? Uh, what is this? Fi- what? Um, yeah, I think that's perfectly put. And I, I do think, first of all, it's about a four page essay. Tsitsipas never went to college. He's got the writing prowess to do it. Go read his response. Read his thought process behind what he meant to convey. Then go read, watch the quote, and to your point, judge for yourself. I, I am, who am I to arbitrate what your opinion should or should not be? We gave our piece last episode. I would recommend my one thing would be go read the statement because it is worth it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and look, it's complex. He's Greek. Mm-hmm. We're American. Yeah. Uh, I did get some feedback that, well, your perspective is quite American. And uh, I mean, I fully accept that. I, I That's my background. This is the world that I know. And I, I that's all I have to work with. Um, so that was, uh, that was certainly interesting. Uh, we will revisit the Curios thread here. Well, what about the press conference? Is that worth bringing up? Do you have any? Quick? Yeah, because it's just worth rehashing Tsitsipas not only – I mean, not only do they play press conference clip of Tsitsipas referring to Nick Kyrgios as bullying him oh, bully. out on yep. court and using those tactics to get in his head, but you also hear the Kyrgios side of things, and not just through his answers in the press conference, with which were cheekier than him unpacking his statements in this documentary, which is to say, hey, look, I'm using this gamesmanship. I'm well aware of what I'm doing. I had to do this to defeat Tsitsipas. There's a 30,000 foot, not 3,000 or 1,000, 30,000 foot view question of, is that attitude something tennis fans want to see more or less of in the game? We can have that debate a different time. But I thought it was fascinating to hit hear Kyrgios again candidly say, yes, I, uh, gamesmanship is part of my tactics. Yeah, I mean, look, good good use of the press conferences here. Yeah. Obviously, that's not exclusive to the to the documentary. You could have seen sure. that after the match, but yeah, they, they did have this back and forth. Uh, and then they went back to uh, the the anonymous tweets, the tweets yeah. from Twitter <laughs> yeah. accounts that like they could have made I these love tweets that that up. Bothers Gruskin. you, Grusky. Literally, these tweets could be made up. There is no <laughs> proof that they're real tweets. When you blur out the username and the profile. There is no verification that these <laughs> tweets were ever sent. Dainu is what they say in our culture, my friend. I agree. Yeah. Uh, and then one thing that Nick does say, if we're talking about this just real quick, I thought he said uh, he told uh, Castine, his girlfriend, that he's not looking at his phone because these comments that he reads, yes. they stay with him. Wasn't that, wasn't that fascinating to hear? Yes. Look, these, we forget this about, I mean, look, I think you and I probably have some awareness of this, but God, these people are human. And when you look at your phone and even if there's eight compliments and one negative comment, the the negative one just stays with you. Well, case in point, I can't help myself but read the comments in your video section. And I'm so grateful the Gil Gross YouTube channel audience is so kind to us. Shout out to the person who said I got even cuter. I would agree. I think I've aged Mm -hmm. well. I Um, saw that. They perhaps get upset when I go on tangents or rants that take us off center, and I will do my best to rein that in. Episode 6 was our first episode of the second batch as one, so i got to re-find my footing. I appreciate everyone's patience. Negative comments are still passion, and that's all I ever appreciate, so send them our way, whatever you think. We want to hear from you. 
I'm glad my tangent there allowed you to bring up that point because I agree. It, you think to yourself, just shut off your phone. But it's like, well, wait, I got to text my mom or I got to call whomever my friend is. And I guess you can turn off the notifications on Twitter. But when it's Nick Curios level notifications, you're just going to see them. It's so personal yes. when it's on your yes. phone. Like it used to be, oh, I'm getting hate mail. Yeah. It's like, that <laughs> That was mail. Like, that was yeah. legitimate mail. You had to open it. It was a choice. You could feel it and be like, ah, it feels like poop. Like, you could yeah. be like, I'm not doing this one. And if you were rich, you could hire someone to open it. <laughs> yeah. So let's go to Anz Jabur. Where's now. Horse? Jabur, uh, that should be Horse's job. I'll read yeah. through your tweets. Uh, Jabur was not really much in, in episode six, but uh, she's kind of introduced here. And uh, Shar Maria Sharapova intros her, says that she is the one after Iga loses that comes to mind as a, a real contender to win this tournament, which I think is accurate. And uh, then we immediately go to Eastbourne because of uh, Serena. Mm -hmm. Ans playing with Serena. Here's my thing on Ans. Uh, I thought that this episode did a good job of just building her stardom. I don't know how much of an effect this has, but there are certain images that I think you can show to the casual that signals, hey, Anja is a big deal. You should care about her. And the first thing was, okay, Serena wanted to play doubles with her. And then the second thing was all the way at the end of the episode when she's in Tunisia. And I don't know, like, I don't understand the context in which she like comes out to like an amphitheater and looked like a rock concert. Uh, but anyway, she did that. And both of those things just made Anz Jabur feel like the big deal that she is. And I feel like that's a service. Amen. The amphitheater scene at the end following, spoiler alert, she loses in the Wimbledon final, was incredible. And to see just people waiting for her to stand out on a balcony, it evokes memories. If you've seen the Maradona doc when Argentina wins the World Cup, I mean, it wasn't quite that, but for a tennis reception for a Wimbledon finalist, not champion, Wimbledon finalist, you're absolutely right. It it felt like the, uh, uh, the scenes of a star, if not a, an already made superstar, a star in the making. I'm playing with Serena and she chose me, which Jabur emphasizes in a quote she discusses. And yeah, it's just, again, you see a r rabid in a tennis sense fan base follows her to press conferences, follows her to the practice court, follows her to matches. She was a superstar. In this episode, I love her. I love the relationship between her and Kareem when she, sh you know, Kareem, who's also her physio, trying to stretch her out and she's accusing him of killing her and then, you know, smacks him in the ass when she's angry with how he's stretched. It's just like those are real life interactions. Those are things everyone can grasp onto. I guess that's the word. She's the most authentic. It's just so clearly there's nothing fake about this shipper performance. I think she's arguably there's no measurement for this but i i wouldn't be surprised if she's gotten more out of this show thus yes. far than anybody else and remember this is again just through episode seven hmm. uh is is where these comments come from I, I don't know that anyone has like been elevated as much as her they showed fritz beating nadal to have that on netflix for the rest of your life if i'm taylor i'm like i win like come on you, i agree <sighs> but but he no you're right back. i i Correct. I also think, look, they got really lucky. Like, Jabur not only has a good clay court season to build up some hype, she makes two slam finals in 2022. She had a narrative-type season, and Netflix got to be along for the ride. So part of it is circumstance, but you're absolutely right. She was one of the biggest risers of 2022, and this docuseries is showing you that. Okay. Now the other side of it, the tennis she does go on to the final. Uh, I, I liked, you're right, like some of the scenes with Kareem stretching her. Uh, there was some backstage footage I was actually watching with Jenna, and she was like, I didn't realize like they warm up so damn hard. <laughs> like, so I'm like, oh, okay, like it's true. It's cool to see them backstage getting ready for the match, and you feel those nervous moments. Again, once they're out on the court, though, and it's Shabur Rybakina in the final, 
I'm not, I'm not getting too much out of that. How did you feel about, about the final, the women's final and how that was portrayed? I was shaking my head as you went into this. This is my biggest qualm with the episode. The entire Jabir run to the final is disingenuously portrayed. Because yes, An Jabir was the not overwhelming favorite, but was one of the shortlist of five front runners throughout the course of the Wimbledon event, certainly as we reached the second week. And, you know, again, Russians didn't play Wimbledon last year. Belarusians didn't play. So there were a wealth of typical contenders that were out of the event. Defending 2021 Wimbledon champ Ashley Barty had retired, and so she wasn't in this event. And that's not something they discussed here in this episode, but that is something they discussed back in episode one. I get that figuratively, she was one of the favorites throughout the course of the event, but she played so many three-set matches, and they talked about her being the favorite against Rabakina, but had they actually explored some of the sloppiness of the tennis we saw from Jabir, and I went back and looked at the stats, and not a lot of plus 60% first serve percentages, a lot more unforced errors than winners overall, you know, negative ratio on those stat sheets. Jabir was a worthy finalist, but she limped to the final, and the tennis fan in me, maybe the tennis journalist in me, was a mm-hmm. little bit upset in the portrayal of her run. That's not meant to... I, I just said she is the a superstar, the rising story of 2022. But I am upset that they didn't show... that. It, I don't know if it was more impressive, or perhaps it makes the final result more anticipated if you tell that story, but it was part of her story at Wimbledon. So you think, this is fascinating, you think that they were playing nice with her when it comes to mainly, is it before the coming into the final or mainly you're talking about the meltdown after winning the first set no. in the final? Well, both. But I think they did a little bit better of portraying the the what flipped for Rabakina. For me, it's quarterfinals, semifinals, where like she, like, I think it was Bozhkova. She played in the quarterfinals yeah. and it was a three-set match. That's not a good result. And I apologize, I'm blanking on who she faced in the semifinals. Another three-set match. Another match that, if my memory is serving me correctly, it's just not a player she should have gone three sets with. You have the answer? You look like you do. Yeah, no, I'll I'll get the answer in a second. Um... But that's my whole theory. It's just why I think they did it is because then when she wins the first set against Rabakina, you're like, see, this is the favorite kind of doing her thing as she approaches the final. And you can't just be all negative names yeah. throughout. you got to build some some arc. But Jabir made the Wimbledon final. She didn't play elite grass court tennis. She was just the best of the rest. No, I mean, the draw, the draw was, so Tatiana Maria in the semifinal. That's who it was, which like, come on. <laughs> yeah, uh, she was, you know, 103 in the world coming in. Uh, they totally kind of, you're right. They smoothed that, smoothed that over. Uh, the highest ranked player that Jabir faced en route to the final was uh, Elise Mertens, 31 in the world at the time, the number 24 seed. Uh, but that's a great point. The draw opened up for Jabir. She was kind of bumping along. Not, not. You're right. Not a one performances. I will say. <laughs> Someone in the comments, you talk about the negatives one sticking with you. Someone goes, yeah, whenever Gruskin says I'll do this quickly, you just know it's not going to be quickly. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this one will be quick. I pro- Again, I laugh at those comments because I'm like, oh, that's pretty funny. Like, this guy knows what he's talking about. Uh, the reason I bring that up quickly here is just, the le- you know, again, the level of play was not that great from Jabir. And I think... It's easier for the show to tell the story of she's always wanted to win Wimbledon. She's a top contender uh, figuratively, according to all the prognosticators. Now she has this opportunity for a crowning moment. It's a way better story to tell. I just think it's not the the full story. Yeah, I I mean, that kind of comes back to like how much of a journalism sensibility is the doc going to take? 
Uh, we can talk about that. Uh, I'll also just add on to kind of wrap up the Jabert thing. I think we've covered our bases there. Is that like they didn't really explain Rybakina at all? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, they showed her. Like they did give you flashes throughout the event of like who's this tall person? Oh, she must be relevant <laughs> later. And then it's like, oh yeah, this is who wins the freaking tournament. Yeah, they they could have. There could have been more. Like let's just explain who this person is. You know. Yeah ultra talented massive serve uh arguably lucky to be able to play wimbledon because you know she just switched federations she's really born in moscow uh ethnically russian you know didn't get into any of that uh there was and then in terms of the tennis itself like you just got like i don't know like some like four second soundbite from john McEnroe on the bbc commentary just oh that's like, not good no <laughs> he, i was gonna say like he'd be like what a serve she has. And it's like, yep, that'll do it. <laughs> that's 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 what we're going to yeah. explain. They showed one nice Jabir backhand slice cross-court pass. She found a ridiculous angle. Yeah. We saw her break early in the first. That's all the tennis we really got. We get a little bit of Isla. I, I, I got to say, there's not much Isla Tomjanovic to talk about here. She was yeah. more of a feature of episode six. Uh, but episode six ended with her making the quarters. So now you got to kind of wrap that up, cover the bases. And once again, Rybakina is the opponent. There's there's not that much here other than, like, to me, the standout moment of this was Isla after the match is pissed and, like, Rotko is once again trying to, like, be positive and be a jokester. Mm -hmm. And, like, the the contrast between those characters, which is daughter and father, was was still it's the gift that keeps on giving hey yeah, he's like i have to be me in this moment she's like stop it and he's like no like come on right like she just go. wants to be alone and pissed off yeah, and rotko is like rotko is like guess we can leave the hotel now yeah exactly no you, yeah that's a great <laughs> line like he gets he gets two minutes of screen time he still might be the biggest winner of back-to-back -back episodes yeah yeah, for Isla, uh, uh, this gets to the two-episode arc question you asked earlier in this show. It's nice to see both the rapid ascent and how incredible that roller coaster ride to the top is when you get a crowning moment like making a quarterfinal, and then you realize still 127 players lose in the singles draw. And as crowning as that moment was of reaching the quarterfinals, she lost the next match from a setup. And it's just like, it can just, the rug gets yanked under you so quickly in this sport. And I'm glad they had the opportunity to show both halves of the equation. Yeah, well said. All right, back to Nick. Back to Nick, and then we'll wrap this up. Curious before the quarterfinal and, and really sequentially after the Titi Pass win, the next we really hear from him after they wrap up that whole hullabaloo is. <laughs> Is the is the sexual assault story right? Don't uh, so say hullabaloo before doing that. But I know. Yes. I I realized as I was saying it that yeah. I put you in a bad spot. Yeah. I got you laughing. Oh, I got you there. laughing, and then Hold I on. and then I went into the leave it stuff. in. But I'm resetting here. Go ahead. Okay, reset, reset. So basically, what they do is they take a bunch of news reports uh, from BBC, Channel Nine in Australia. They let the reporters kind of say the story, which is kind of classic documentary. Uh, then they go to Nick's press conference where he's asked a question. Hey, do you have a comment? Nick goes, no, lawyer said I can't comment, no comment. And that's it. That's what they did. So I have thoughts. Let me go to you first. What did you make of that situation? I had forgotten, actually, that that whole thing first came about uh, in the middle of Wimbledon. I totally forgot that that was in the middle of Wimbledon. I appreciate you setting the scene in the sense that they did portray it as a breaking news story in the midst of a tournament, and they showed you the various news bulletins, and this was a story that also broke through the mainstream sporting conscience, but you're too gracious as a host, so I'm curious your response to this, because you're right, it it was brief. It, they, they didn't spare details. But it was a very condensed storyline, and I'm curious how you saw – if you think that was a conscious yeah. choice and how you saw the portrayal. I mean, first of all, not ignoring it builds credibility. Yes. It builds trust in what they're doing. Uh, when, you, when you willfully ignore this stuff, as they kind of did 
in like the first episode when, again, like Kyrgios earlier in the, earlier in this episode and in episode one of this entire series uh, said like the media has painted me as the villain in tennis. And then at no point did the docuseries come in and be like, well, counter to that, you know, there's actual, there's actual reasons why this, this guy is given actual reason for why fans don't like him. It, it doesn't come out of thin air. So I thought the fact that, you know, they could let Nick say his piece, that's what this is about, but also not ignore this. That's a good thing. What they didn't do was bring anything new, um, any insight on this to the table. There's nothing behind the scenes. There's nothing backstage. There's no, you know, in the context of the interviewing for Breakpoint where they get these players one-on-one, -on -one, there's nothing there. So basically what the docuseries did, did well was not ignore it. But that's the extent to what they did. They didn't give you anything extra. And like, frankly, it would have been nice and it would have been cool if they did give you something like, where was Nick when this, when he found out that this, this had was happening, uh, that the, the media was knowing this. Look, I don't know if the cameras were there at the time, but something like that, or at least like after the fact, maybe they could have gotten out of the legal trouble here. Maybe, but maybe not. And I know that kind of ties your hands. You're handcuffed with the legal stuff. Uh, but it's like, so what was it like? Did it affect you at all playing while this stuff was happening? Yeah, well, I agree with your portrayal of the media, uh, of, again, the credibility built by the documentary in showing not just in this episode and episode six and in introducing Kyrgios early on, the dark past for Nick Kyrgios, showing the demons he's faced, talking last episodes about the fact that he seriously did contemplate suicide, that he did check himself into a psych ward, that he did have issues with drug and alcohol abuse early in his career. They set the context for all of that, and the only, and I love that the show does that, and I love that they, mm -hmm. and that Nick Kyrgios allowed the show to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't love the fact that in discussing this sexual assault charge, a serious one, one that has, I believe, been played out in Australian court, um, at least the criminal charge. Mm -hmm. I don't like that it portrays Nick Kyrgios as a victim, or as a, this being a crime of circumstance, that Nick is a victim given all the mental trauma he suffered in his past. I'm not saying that that doesn't play a factor in it, because of course it does. And again, I just went uh, discussed how I appreciate them discussing that. But to your point in offering something new or offering the other perspective, what was the charge? What was Nick accused of? What was the scenario so that, again, it's not just so superficially painted over as, well, this is a guy who's gone through a lot of trauma in his life, and this instance is just another obstacle of trauma for him to have to overcome, which to me is, to go full circle, my greatest fear is that they portray this as an obstacle for him to overcome and not a serious indictment of some of the negative flaws in his character. Yeah, I, there's some of that. I, and I would I would agree with you, but most of that is a product of just letting Nick say his piece yeah. and not having anyone to to come in there and and challenge Nick's Agreed. piece. Exactly. Um, yes. Now, uh, by the way, for for those who may have kind of lost the the plot on this, uh, the the charges were dismissed because uh, Nick ad admitted he did it, and I believe they they settled. Um, yeah. So basically. The charge was dismissed by the by a magistrate after he pleaded guilty. So that's how this would end up being resolved. Uh, that's not in the doc. That's just so listeners and viewers know. They move on. Curios Gareen quarterfinal. Uh, they have a thing about like Curios badgering the box and Horse and Colleen talk about like what it's like to sit in Nick's box when he is constantly. And this was a common theme during Wimbledon. And I know like even Bill Simmons. Who, who we like, he tweeted about it, about how funny it is that like, no matter what Nick's box do, does, Nick is like asking for more. And like, they're literally expected to stand and clap after every point. And I saw it in person at the US Open. Uh, and it was just so incredible to watch how like, if you're in Nick's box and you don't give him a standing ovation after he wins a point, like he's, 
that's unacceptable, man. Yeah. Like, I don't care if the other guy double faulted. You better get up. All right. Um, so that was that was interesting. And then after that, it's pretty much setting up the Wimbledon final against Novak Djokovic. Any thoughts on on all of this? I agree. I think it's an important sequence to, again, uh, an important feature of Nick's demeanor on court to explain. I'm glad they went into it. I'm glad that they interviewed Horace and Colleen, to your point, and that they were can- and Nick's sister, and they were candid about, yeah, it sucks. Like, it, it's really weird. And at the same time, you do want, like, Nick to know, and I have felt this rooting for my younger brother, where I know if I am rooting for him vociferously in positive times, nothing's better. If I'm getting on him when he's losing, he would throw his racket at me if there was an offense there, and he, you know, again, wouldn't get a point penalty for it. And you're treading that line. And that's the single most real, you know, again, that is tennis at its most raw, unrefined aspect. And it's real. And again, it has both positives and negatives. I get why Nick's asking for more out of his box. There's nothing that can fire you up quite like when the people around you are fired up as well. It speaks to the ridiculousness of Nick. I agree with you. I'm glad you pointed it out because it was a fun detail. Yeah, it, it was good, and it's also why Nick doesn't have a coach. I mean, to yeah. to his credit, I, I think Nick's perspective on it is like, I can't have a coach. Yeah. Like, it wouldn't really be fair for yeah. me to have a coach. Like, nobody should be subjected to that. Yeah. I mean, nobody is fit for that position, and that's why, you know, it's it's Horace, who's his best pal forever, and it's, it's Castine, um, and it's just, it's better that way. His father is in there. Uh, so these are people who kind of have more personal relationships with Nick because uh, nobody's going to come in on the outside and really, like, be in that position. Uh, okay, Kyrgios Djokovic final. They build it up. Uh, I, I think it's worth saying that when they, you know, Wimbledon is just, the imagery of it is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. When they're walking through the tunnel and they're wa- even when they're walking on center court, there's uh, an elegance to the All England Club that comes across, I think, really well. Uh, that's spectacular. And um, I think one of the times it shows up is when they're just building up a match and they're showing these guys walking through the grounds and walking uh, through the locker room and, and all of that stuff. What did you think of the Kyrgios Djokovic final? Was there anything that stuck out from, from the men's final? Um, and how that all went down. I loved the walkout scene, the grandeur of the hallways, the music they played to hype up the moment. I loved the conversation with Kyrgios, the importance of the first set. That is a little tennis nerddom. And, you know, again, Kyrgios discussing the difficulties that is playing what is almost perfection in Novak Djokovic, particularly on that surface. I love that they talked... Mm. Eric Kyrgios talks through, again, the prolonged mental struggle that is that battle because he doesn't give you an inch. I even love the post-match. They shake hands. They go to the chair. Kyrgios sits on the bench, and they show you a camera shot. I'm sorry. A camera shot of Nick Kyrgios looking down from his bench at Novak Djokovic with his arms in the air and the crowd celebrating. Because I have always wondered, what's it like when you're sitting at the bench looking at that? Because certainly when you're watching on TV, the camera's giving you the panorama shot of the winner. To see it from that perspective, the crowd goes crazy, your opponent's arms are in the air, and you are just sitting there dejected. Like, it's just a little six-second shot of... Oh my God, like that would be the most overwhelming moment of my life. I cannot even imagine. And I thought it was really well portrayed. Yeah, good cinematography note, Grusky. <laughs> I'm learning, slowly learning. I agree. Well, the the final, if you lose the final, you can't leave. Yeah. If you lose any other match, you can go straight to your bag, start packing up and get out of there. Get out of Dodge, but... That's, I think, what's so one of the things that's so hard about losing the final. We saw Jabur crying backstage. They got that. Um, and I loved and it, that, by the way. That's another yes. thing where just, again, how empty you are, dejected. The fact that everyone does the corny, you got to look at the positives. You learn more from defeat. And it's like even at the highest level of the game, that's all you can say to someone in that moment because 
We've all been there. It it was incredible. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I really liked Nick's commentary throughout the final against Me Novak. Too. He really provided some of what we want. Uh, now, look, it wasn't it wasn't about showing specific points and and demonstrating that kind of thing. But like Curio said, and I wrote this down about Novak. He's calmer. You can't rush him. He's more patient. And you can't teach that. It comes from experience. I I just I love how that paints Novak Djokovic and the the control that he has over his tennis, which is just second to none. Uh and part of that is technical. The fact that like it doesn't really matter what you throw at him, he's never gonna be rushed and he's never gonna overpress. He's really not going to miss. He's mentally just going to be right there at all times, never going to go away. I mean, it, it it was so good to hear that from him, and it was so uh, it was so illuminating. So, man, like Nick, Nick's Nick's been good at this. You know, this whole breakpoint thing. Nick has delivered. Couldn't agree more. Fair to say. Perfectly said. That's all I got. Uh, we can get your best quote. Well. Uh, this is the tough question, right? It's got to be Rotko. I, 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 could, I have to be myself. Like, it's just, <laughs> it, he's right. He's like, you just, in that moment, you have to be yourself. I think that's the best quote of the match. But to your Love point, it. just to add to that, yeah, Kyrgios is a commentator. Just saying, this is the challenge that is facing Novak Djokovic. And this man, I like he goes 30, 40 Grand Slam finals. And you're like, nowadays, we know he's he's played 34. And you're like, oh, that's ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I, it's, I would say best quote, probably Kyrgios. Biggest winner, who you going with? Uh, best quote, excuse me, Rotko. Biggest winner? Biggest winner. Um. Hmm. It's tough. I mean, look. I mean, look. I I did the thing about Jabir. Yeah. I I think uh... Jabir in the Coliseum's the answer because <laughs> just imagine walking out to that as a human. You'd be like, oh, did I do something? You're like, you got. I I think the first thing I'd say is like, you know, I lost. I just like I want you yeah. all to know you're. I am a runner up. Like, let's save the party for when we win. Um. I think that's a really good pick. What about story you want to see more of? Anything from this you would have liked unpacked more? I for me it was the Jabir yeah. arc of getting to the final. What's it for you? Yeah, that's a great choice. Uh for me, it's okay, like you had two matches against Rybakina. Could we get yeah. anything? Could we get anything for Rybakina? <laughs> Just considering yeah. like she ended up being the foil. But I, I, I also will say, and we said this about Rafa in the first five episodes. When there's a certain distance from the enemy, it does say something about the enemy. It gives the enemy uh, a certain intimidation factor. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Now, that's a little more effective for Nadal and Djokovic than it is for like Elena Rybakina, who did very talented, but came out of nowhere for this Wimbledon. Nobody picked Elena Rybakina to win. And I don't even know if that was really uh, communicated at any point. I'll sneak a joke here into minute 44. Two halves of the equation. Rabakina beat Tomjanovic in three sets. Other half it took her three sets to beat Tomjanovic. Like, eh, it's fine. <laughs> like, again, it's like, if we're being honest intellectually about the tennis, but no, I, perfectly put. She was such a big part of that Wimbledon, and you saw five flashes of her face. This has been Episode 7, Saints and Sinner. For Alex Gruskin, I'm Gil Gross. Thanks for watching the Breakpoint Recap Show, available on the Cracked Rackets Network of Podcasts and the Gil Gross YouTube channel.